All right, are you guys ready and excited this morning? Yes, me too. We are going to be getting into a question that is, it's a question that all of us have asked in some way, shape, or form, I think. Now, we don't always formulate this question, but we've all got it rumbling around in our heads, and it pops up in specifics in certain ways in certain times. And, uh, and the question you could put, it could be put this way, but given enough time, can a person, culture, or even a country solve all of its problems? Why or why not? Now, on this note, we have a special couple of people here. We notice that the police are here today. And I was going to ask them to maybe give their answer, but I thought, no, we don't want to do that. I'm not putting them on the spot. Um, but isn't it interesting to think and ask ourselves, like, you know, wow, I mean, it's not just can we solve our problems, but give it enough time. Like, if we had a lot of time to try to solve our problems, me as a person, me as a culture, me as a nation, could we ever get to the place where all human problems got solved? I mean, it's interesting, right? Because we all have opinions about what would make our community better, our culture better, our family better, right? We all have opinions, and we get kind of passionate, kind of excited about our opinion a lot of the time, right? I mean, and yet this question is a really interesting question to like kind of linger out there. Like, even if we got our own way all of the time, would we get to this place where all of our problems were solved? Even if I got, if the government worked exactly like I think it should, which would be a disaster, by the way, because I don't know nearly enough about it. Would, it. would it deal with all the problems? Like, if you could get your own way just for your own life and your own family, would your family then be a perfect family? And you know, what's really interesting is when you start to look at what happens when I get a solution in my life is that 10 more problems tend to show up. Right? You please one group of people in a society, and all of a sudden there's 10 angrier groups that they didn't solve their problems. What is it about us as people in the world that we continually have this problem and problems that we can't quite seem to get solved? And maybe you feel like there is an answer to that that's better than mine. And that is acceptable, by the way. And if you haven't, I'd love to hear it after the service uh, for sure, because it would, I'd be fascinated to know what your thoughts are. Um, I was listening to one of my favorite pastors, a guy named Timothy Keller, and he was talking about this book. I haven't read it, but I trust him enough to, to go for it. Um, but this guy, Jacob Needleman, is a philosopher, wrote this. He's a, a professor of, of, at San Francisco State University. He's part of a fellowship of philosophers that come out of Berkeley. Smart guy. Wrote a book called, Why Can't We Be Good? And what's interesting about this book is he's not coming at it from a religious standpoint. He's not coming at it from a Christian standpoint. He's just coming at it from a philosophical standpoint. Like, a lot of philosophy is all about society. Like, how do we fix society? Like, maybe education. If we could just teach people, like, how to get along, why couldn't we all just learn how to get along? Right? If we taught that everybody's got their own story and their own background and their own problems, and they're just working through them, couldn't we all see eye to eye and get along better? I mean, couldn't we start to fix stuff and really be united and come together? And, and he says, you know, we're asking these great big questions, but why can't we just be good by ourselves? Like, what's... What's wrong with the human race that as an individual, I can't be good? Leave me in a room by myself. Why can't I be good? I mean, the ice cream keeps calling my name. Nobody's tempting me. I mean, I bought it. Tempting myself, maybe. I mean, right, and why can't I just be good all by myself? Why can't I keep my own moral shoulds and should nots? Like I tell my children, there's certain things they should do and they shouldn't do. But then do I always behave in that way? Or do things come out of my mouth that aren't true? Or do you remember your parents doing this to you? Especially if you had siblings, you, you, they would say like, okay, you need to go and apologize to your brother or your sister. Yeah. Do you remember? All of us old people had to do this. We all had to go and apologize to our siblings. And then your parents almost always said, no, mean it. Yeah. You're like, how the heck do what you mean? Oh, you mean fake it. Got it. Yeah, I'm really sorry that I hit you, even though you're a total jerk and I'm glad I did it. Right? I mean, it's, it's, there's something far more fundamentally wrong with us as people than we, than we often know or have an answer for, but it's self-evident if we just stop to think about it in a lot of ways. Like, what is this about us? So this question is, is a question that we're going to be kind of talking through and looking for an answer from Jesus on as we go through a story of Jesus today. And it's one of the greatest hits of Jesus. So if you're visiting with us today, great job coming today. You're getting Jesus' greatest hits. Like it's one of them. It's one of the best stories of Jesus. I love this one. So quick little background. This all started because Jesus got bad news. 
one of his close friends, his cousin actually, but a fellow uh, religious leader of his day named John the Baptist was arrested and executed by one of the kings. And he found out that John the Baptist has been killed. So he's trying to get away from these crowds of people that love him. Uh, because Jesus is a rock star of the first generation in Israel. He is the Taylor Swift of his generation. I can't say that enough, like to try to help you understand. He can't go anywhere without people coming out of the woodwork going like, oh my gosh, it's Jesus! Like they're doing that because he's healing people, right? He's doing miracles. He's healing people of diseases that we can't even heal. Paralysis, blindness, I mean, epilepsy. Like he's not just taking away symptoms. He's healing people these things. So everywhere he goes, people are coming out all over the place. Anybody with a splinter wants to see Jesus, right? And so they are coming out left and right. So he's just trying to get away from these crowds. So he hops in a boat, sails across this lake, the Sea of Galilee. But when he gets to the other side, the crowds figured out where he's going. They just ran around the lake and met him on the other side. So he's still got these crowds. So he ends up, says he's, he feels compassion for these people, loves on them, heals on them. And then that night he says, you know what? We should feed everybody. Like nobody expects him to, but he, he decides, you know what? We should feed them. So he tells the disciples, let's feed them. And they're like, we don't have any food, but they get a donation of five little loaves of bread and two fish from a little boy who gives his lunch or his dinner. And Jesus takes it, prays for it, begins to break it up, pass it around, gives it to his disciples to hand out, and it feeds this crowd of thousands of people. It's one of these extraordinary moments. We pick up the story right here from that point, because we talked about that last week, where it says this. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. Now, this is this ancient world's version of getting into the armored limo and driving away from the crowds, right? That's why Jesus is always in a boat. They're always trying to, okay, we got to get away. There's too many people because crowds aren't really nice even when they love you, right? They don't think about you. They're just like, I want to touch you. I want your autograph. I want to interrupt your life, like, I, right? That's how crowds work. And so they, they just need a break sometimes. So he sends his disciples in the boat, doesn't go with them. He just sends them across the lake. He dismisses, he sent the people home, and after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray, and night fell while he was there alone. So Jesus finally gets a little alone time, but it takes the mountains in the middle of the night to pull it off. But he goes up there where he prays to God, his Father, the same way he actually tells all of us to pray to God as your Father. And he spends the night in prayer talking to God. I wish it told us what about, but he spends the night doing that. And then it says, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. And when his disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified and in their fear cried out, it's a ghost. I love this stuff. Try to imagine, even if you don't believe in Jesus or the Gospels or the validity, just get into the story. Just think of this as like a Marvel movie for a moment, right? It's not real, but you know what? There's a good story going on here, and I might even learn something about human nature, right? It's fascinating, right? Here's the story. I love this. So Jesus decides he's going to meet up with his disciples. The easiest way is he's just going to walk across the lake. It's a little cool cheat that only the Son of God can do, right? So he's like, I'm just going to walk across. Now, there's multiple Gospels. There's four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that all tell the story of Jesus, but they all tell from a little bit of a different angle and person. And I love how Mark, who is Peter, is, right, is the one writing behind it, says that Jesus actually intended to just bypass them and meet them at the beach. He didn't, he didn't intend to come to the boat at all, which I think is hilarious. Like, Jesus is like, I'm just going to sneak by, walking on the water. But the disciples see him, and what do they do? They go into a full-blown panic. They're like, but, but I mean, what else do you do? You're in a boat in the dark, at night, in a storm, and there's an object that's too tall that's moving along the water, and you're like, we only got a few options. Loch Ness, right? Option number one in my mind, or two, it's a ghost, right? That's all they got. So they're like, either way, this is bad news, right? So they're like, oh my gosh, it's a ghost, right? Whoa, what do we do? Total panic kicks in, but Jesus spoke to them at once, said, don't be afraid. Take courage, I am here, which sounds a little bit like Superman. Like, it's very formal. Take courage. I don't know he said it that way exactly. I think all he said was like, whoa, guys, it's me. Or to dial it down a notch. Relax. There's no ghosts out here. I'm not even Loch Ness, right? I mean, it's, a, it's not Nessie, right? This is, oh, you're okay. Be, take courage. Peter called out to him. Listen to, this, listen to his terminology. This is great. Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. 
So Peter went over to the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. Now, before you look at him walking on the water, look at his statement. Lord, if it's really you. So like Peter's idea is like, let me give you a quick test. If it's really you, tell me to jump out of this boat. What if it's not really Jesus? I mean, how sure are you right now, Peter? Is this like 85% certainty? You're like, I'm willing to jump out of the boat for 85% sure it's Jesus. But if, what if it's not Jesus? What kind of answer does he expect to get? Maybe no answer? I don't know. I don't think he's thinking about it. It's not logical. He's just in an emotional moment. And this is what spills out of him is this, well, if it's you. I've, this is what I love about Peter. If you want to learn anything as a follower of Jesus from Peter, one of the things that you've got to, got to love and appreciate is he is the guy who does really the exact opposite of what my dad taught me to do. My dad always told me, Corey, think before you act. And Peter routinely acts before he thinks. I work on it. I don't always do it right either. But I love that he's just like ready to go there. I mean, his attitude is almost always, if that's where Jesus is, then that's where I'm going. I'm just going to be with Jesus. Like he is super committed to this idea. Even when his body can't pull it off, that's what he wants to be. That's where he wants to be. And I love that he is like, he's the only guy saying anything. No, I don't think anybody else in the boat's even thinking about it. But Peter's like, whoa, if Jesus is out there, then I should be there. If my master walks on water, I should be walking on water. And so he's like, Jesus, if it's you, 51% sure it's you. If it's you, tell me to come out. And he does. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. I mean, okay, just get into the moment. Here's Peter landing on these waves. I mean, taking a step on water. What is that even like to walk on water? I mean, I can't even wrap my head around how unnatural that is to walk on water, right? I mean, that's just beyond crazy. But look at this. When he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Now, please picture this. Here's Peter standing, looking at Jesus, eyeball to eyeball, right? And then, I love this. What does it say? He saw the strong wind in the waves. And I always wonder, like, what does that mean? Like, how did that play out in his eyes? Is he looking at Jesus and he's watching Jesus' beautiful long hair, like, blow in the wind? And he's like, Jesus' hair looks so good right now. Like, I wonder if my hair looks that good. And he's thinking about how strong that wind is. He's like, wow, it is really blowing. And then he's thinking like, wow, there's a lot of wind. And then I think he's like, look at all these waves. And at some point, his brain just flips that simple switch that's so fast that it's just like, nobody walks on water. You can't walk on water. Like, I'm going to die. You can't do that. I mean, he's wearing all these heavy clothes. He doesn't have a life preserver on, right? Some point, his brain goes from Jesus to oh my gosh, what the heck am I doing? Like, I can't believe I walked out here. I was only 51% sure to begin with. What the heck? And immediately begins to sink. And while Jesus says that his faith isn't very good, notice his faith is enough to be able to say these words, Jesus, save me. And if nothing else, just note that that is a beginning level amount of faith for any of us. I mean, anybody, and probably frankly, everybody at some point in their life has prayed to God to save them. Might have just been from getting a bad grade on a test to any other number of messes that we make out of our life on a daily choice that we go, God, if you will just fix this, I will never do this again. You don't have to be a believer in anything. You can be an agnostic. You can even be an atheist. And we get desperate enough as people, a little bit of faith spills out of us. A little bit of desperation, hope faith spills out of us. And for Peter, if he's got nothing else, he's got that. And it's enough for Jesus to reach down and grab him. Now, it never says like exactly how he grabbed him. So here's where my imagination kicks in. I like to think he gets him by the hair. <laughs> just before his head goes under the waves, he's like, go, gotcha. And then it's just Jesus and Peter's head out of the water. Like, that's it. <laughs> and of course, Jesus is standing on the water still. So he's like, got him looking at him like eye to eye going like, dude, why are you doubting me? <laughs> like, I'm still standing on the waves. Like, it's one thing if Jesus is sinking, then you're like, whoa, this guy can't walk on water either. But it's another thing when Jesus is just standing there and you're like, what? I love this question. This is such a great thing because this is something about Peter and us that we have so much in common. Because one thing you see here is that faith is not this simplistic, straightforward concept. 
that faith is much harder than it sounds when we sometimes talk about faith and what we believe in, especially when we're talking about an intentional belief in a person, which is far more really a language of trust. What can they do? What are they capable of? What is their character and nature like? What can I trust them for? And I love that Jesus says, why do you doubt me? And that word doubt, all it really means is this. is like, why did you divide your attention? Why did you divide what you care about? Why did you divide yourself from being focused on me to being focused on something else? And that's all that doubt means is something I believe in. And I split my mind to say, but what about that? I'm not sure I can trust that. I'm not sure I can believe that. I'm not sure I care about that. I'm not sure that's the most important thing. And that's all that he says, like, why would you divide yourself in this moment? Why would you let your focus split, your belief split, your mindset split? When they climbed back in the boat, the wind stopped. And then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Now, this is another great picture. How exactly did Jesus get Peter back into the boat? I like to think that he just drags him through the water. <laughs> Come on, I got you. Right? I mean, just brrr, brrr, pulling him through. Gives him the big old, like, lift up in there, grabs him by the belt, gives him a wedgie right as he's going into the boat, dumps Peter in, steps into the boat. Meanwhile, all the other disciples, none of them got out of the boat, right? So they're just inside going like, Peter did it again. Oh, my gosh. I mean, for a minute, they had to be envious, like, oh, my gosh, he's walking on water. And then, boosh, and they're like, yep, glad I didn't go out there. <laughs> but notice this, the disciples, it says, worshipped him. Like, they arrive at this moment, where, and they arrive there not because Peter walked on the water or because Jesus did. Notice this, it's the wind and the waves stopped. All of a sudden, nature gets quiet again, and they worship him. In fact, it says that they declare, you really are the Son of God. And that really are is important because it's one thing to say, like, okay, maybe, or I kind of, or yeah, I've heard that, or I can even regurgitate that. But it's another thing for that to get into your heart and to go like, oh my gosh, you're not just a person that God is working through. You're not just a person that God is doing miracles through. You are God. That's a very different person. And if you could go back in your minds when we covered Matthew, or if you've read through this gospel lately, you know, several chapters ago, which was like a year ago for us, we read the story of Jesus being in this same boat with these same guys, only in a bigger storm, where they all thought they were going to die because the storm was so big, and Jesus was asleep in the back of it, right? And they wait to the point where it looks like it's absolutely a catastrophe, and they wake up Jesus by yelling at him and saying, don't you care about us? We're going to drown. And then Jesus gets up, and he just says, he speaks to the wind and the waves, and he says, be quiet, be still, and everything goes quiet and still. And the disciples go from the terror of almost dying to the terror of asking this question, who the heck is this guy? Who are we in a boat with? Who can yell at weather? And weather just responds. It wasn't a prayer he prayed. He just told the weather like he was the boss. You're done. And it was done. And they're asking this question, who is he? And they get to the shore that next morning, and they get out of the boat. And as they get out of their boat, and they're pulling up, afraid of almost having died, they got that adrenaline rush, and they got the adrenaline rush of Jesus calming the storm, and they're terrified. They get there, and all of a sudden, they see this naked man running at them, screaming, who's covered in blood and scars. I'm sure at that point, I'm like, let's get back in the boat. Wherever we land, this is not a good place to get. But here comes another guy. This guy's yelling and screaming, running at them, and it says that he runs up, and he falls down at Jesus' feet, but he says, Jesus, son of the most high God, have you come here before our time to torture us? And I don't have time to unpack that whole line. That's pretty fascinating, isn't it? Turns out through conversation, this man is possessed by a myriad of demons, unclean spirits that Jesus ultimately casts out. And the next time you get to see this guy, he is seated at Jesus' feet in his right mind and fully clothed. But he's answered this question in a fascinating way for these disciples, this suggestion of, wait a minute, Jesus, son of the most high God? has begun to put this thought into their brains. And I think at this point, after now maybe years of following Jesus, years of all that they've been with Jesus, they're beginning to see a little bit more clearly who he is. But look at this. We're going to jump to the gospel of Mark for one moment. Look at Peter's take. It says this. They were all terrified when they saw him, but Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. They were totally amazed, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. Peter says, you know, when I look back and I summarize what was going on in us, 
Why we were so amazed, and by amazed he means surprised, freaked out, like what the heck is going on? We're amazed because we didn't understand. We didn't understand the significance of the miracle that we had just seen the night before. In fact, the miracle, we're still carrying the leftovers with us. They've been snacking on miracle bread and fish all night long. Like it's right there in their faces. But he's looking back going like, we didn't get it. Jesus did this awesome thing in front of us and we thought that was an awesome thing, but it didn't penetrate any deeper than that. It was this superficial Jesus made food, and we love food. Man, I love Jesus. He makes great food. And that's as deep as it got for him. He's like, we didn't understand. If we had understood the significance of it, we wouldn't have been shocked or amazed or surprised or terrified. But he says, their hearts were too hard to take it in. They had hard hearts. Just think, you know, hardened arteries for a moment. Things can't pass through them. Life can't flow through them, right? They're getting blocked up, stuck up, gunked up. This is a fundamental problem that shows up all throughout Scripture defining human beings and our ability or inability to believe and or trust in God. No matter what our experience with God, no matter how vivid they are like theirs is, or sometimes invisible like ours, it is a constant human problem to understand What is the greatness and significance of who God, who Jesus actually is? What is the point of all these things that he's doing? You can put it this way, that your heart and heart is what's wrong with the world. It's the very thing Jesus is coming to fix. That's what Peter is pointing at. But we can't even believe or understand what he's doing, let alone how he's going to fix us. Even if he's providing all of the solutions, we don't get it, accept it, receive it, let alone love it. And what we find is that our hearts are the place where all of this transaction with God has to take place. And we need God to do something in our hearts for this to actually work. You know, if you just kind of come back to the simplicity of Scripture, the Bible, the whole story of what God made us for, wants for us, and how it ends, it comes down to this. You were created to love wholeheartedly. You were created to love God wholeheartedly, and you were created to love people wholeheartedly, and you were created to love nature wholeheartedly, and frankly, it was all created to love you back. There was meant to be this simple, wholehearted nature in us and and all around us, all emanating from God himself in terms of the closeness that we were to have. And when the Bible talks about this thing called sin, this little word that has big implications, it's that sin is what is destroying your heart's ability to love and to give love. to to be able to receive the fullness of God's love and the fullness of people's love, as well as to give it. That that, this sin issue is something that resides not just in our actions, but it resides inside of us. It's a part of our nature, you might say, or our character. Jesus put it this way in Mark 7. He said, you know, from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, Lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these vile things come from within, and they are what defile you. All of these things are the things that get into our heart, and you could say pollute it, but in many ways, if you just think of your heart as a vessel, as a cup, as something that has limitations, it can only be filled full of so much stuff. One thing has to replace another. You can't be full of all of this and be able to receive God's love. It's not that God doesn't ever love you fully and completely and unconditionally. It's just that we can't take it in. We can't understand the significance. Just like Peter is saying, we couldn't understand the significance of these miracles that Jesus is doing right in front of us because our hearts were full of other things. And we come by all of this stuff naturally, natively. Like We don't have to teach any of these things. We just arrive at them through natural conclusions, not even because we decide to. I mean, I don't think probably anybody gets married with the thought of like, I can't wait to commit adultery. If you do, that's a really rough wedding. Right, but we don't think that. We don't want that. People, I don't think people start off life going like, I just want to murder people. I mean, at a certain point, sure. But we don't start that way, right? Some other things have to happen, but we get there naturally like, you know what, it's going to happen. But it doesn't matter whether it's deceitfulness or slander. I mean, one of those things where we're like, we always want to teach people, like, don't say things that are untrue about other people, but then we do it. 
I mean, maybe not always just people we know. There's lots of people we don't know that we like to slander. I mean, any politician is free game. Unless you're a follower of Jesus, in which he's like, no, it's not. Jesus says all of these things are what get inside of us, pollute us, and keep us hardened so that we cannot even hear or understand the crazy, awesome, powerful, amazing love that God has and wants to speak over every single one of us. If you go back to one of the great statements of the whole Bible, it's back in Deuteronomy 6, and he's, God is speaking this over Israel and to Moses, and he says, look, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And when he says that first part, the Lord is our God, the Lord is alone, he means this, we're in this relationship with God. God wants you to know that we're his, you're his people, and all he wants is for you to make him your God. Like it's this mutual exchange. You receive his love, you give him his love back. Love God with all of your heart. And when the Hebrews use this word heart, they didn't have a lot of distinction. They just mean everything inside of you, your thoughts, your emotions, your will, your choices, your dreams, like all that you can do internally and process is what they mean by your heart. Be a wholehearted person for God. And they say that with all your soul, soul includes all of who you are. It's, it's you, it's you physically, it's you spiritually, it's your body. I mean, it's literally the word for neck or throat. And it just comes to mean a person. Love God with as a person, wholeness. With all of your strength, this is my favorite word. I learned this from the Bible Project guy, Tim Mackey, who was making being a Bible nerd cool again. It's awesome. He says strength is literally the Hebrew word for much. And he said it might be better expressed right here in its tense as muchness, which probably isn't a real English word. But you got to convey this thought. Love God with all of you. You know what muchness is? Muchness is when you're watching somebody play a sport and you're like, they gave 110%, just terrible math right? But we all know what they mean. They gave it everything they've got. Like they went maybe above and beyond what they had to do. Like they were all in is how we would say it. And that's what that means. All your strength means be all in your love for God. Like this is what God wants, to love him fully and completely because you're his and he is yours. And so we get hung up on this. In fact, it's hard to understand how God can command you to love him passionately. How can love be a command? How does that work? How, do we, how does a command become something that is felt or is sincere, we might say? Or we might even try to use the word real or authentic as opposed to just simply an obligation. But the greatness of God is so great that it has to be both. The greatness of God is so different than another person loving you and requiring or expecting you to love them. The the greatness of God is the very God. He was the artist who created you and formed you and literally both biologically holds your body together. But he's also the God who created you for a purpose and sees your future, who you can be, who you will be, who he wants you to be. He holds your whole life and he sees it and he made it because he wanted you to exist in his world. He wanted to be able to love you fully and completely and for you to be a people who could wholly and fully love him as well. You know, we all kind of know what it's like when we learn to love somebody, maybe for the first time, or we go through that sort of phase of falling in love, right? There's that point when you fall in love with somebody where all of a sudden, everybody else's maybe opinions about you and about your life, about what was cool or what you should wear, suddenly all their opinions became far less important, right? Because this person that you're in love with, their opinion just rose, right? It went maybe through the roof, And all of a sudden, everybody else mattered so much, but now you're like, you know what? None of you guys matter compared to this person, right? Isn't it amazing what you'll do when you fall in love with someone? I have a daughter who is taking a hunter's safety course. (laughs) This is the last daughter I would have ever even invited to take a hunter's safety course. She would never want to harm an animal, but now she's saying, I'm willing to kill. Because she may have fallen in love with a hunter. And I'm really glad they're both here today. I mean, I'm not telling you which daughter. Fill in the blank. If that's not a clear enough picture, let me just show you a little video clip. Uh, How many of you guys have ever seen the TV show Big Bang Theory? 
Yep, okay, it's good. You guys are going to know what we're talking about. If you haven't seen this, uh, there's two characters all you need to know about. A guy named Sheldon who is uh, brilliant, but somewhere on the spectrum, he doesn't really do people. He doesn't understand the social interaction side. He's hyper-logical, hyper-brilliant. Don't touch him, please. He'll die, right? Uh, but man, he does everything mechanically. Like He's learned how to interact with people. And he's got a neighbor, a, a woman named Penny, and they are friends, but it's a comedy, right? So it's, she's extremely emotional, normal, uh, reactionary, relational, and he is like always the cerebral guy who loves Star Trek uh, in a big way. Well, one Christmas, she tells him, I got you a Christmas present. And he understands that gifts are obligatory. Someone gives you a gift, you have to give them a gift back. And if you don't think that's true, by the way, don't buy anybody a gift for Christmas or their birthday. See what happens. They're obligatory. We expect there to be some form of repayment. And he knows this, but he doesn't know the value of the gift. So he decides to go out and buy her 10 different gifts of different values. And he wraps them all, and he hides them all in his room, and then waits to see what she's going to get him so he can get the appropriate gift to bring to her of equal value. That's how his brain works. Okay, check this out. Oh, a napkin. <laughs> Turn it over. To Sheldon, live long and prosper, Leonard Nimoy. He came into the restaurant, sorry the napkin's dirty, he wiped his mouth with it. <laughs> I possess the DNA of Leonard Nimoy. Do you realize what this means? <laughs> All I need is a healthy ovum and I can grow my own Leonard Nimoy. Okay, all I'm giving you is the napkin, Shelby. Be right back. Here, open it. Oh. Oh, the gift certificate for motorcycle lessons. <laughs> Very thoughtful. Yeah, and I checked. Not letting the bike fall on you while standing still is lesson one. <laughs> well, then I think you'll appreciate what I got you. Okay. A hundred and one totally cool science experiments for kids. <laughs> You know, because you're so into science. <laughs> Sheldon, what did you do? I know. <laughs> it's not enough, is it? Here. It's a Saturnalia miracle. <laughs> that is a wonderful picture of what we're talking about when we talk about that we are in this relationship with a God who loves us wholeheartedly. That we're in a relationship with God that requires us to have a heart that is changed to love back. And the only way that it can happen, I mean, do you hear those incredible words? I love those words of Sheldon there at the end. You hear what he said? She said, Sheldon, what have you done? And he said, I know it's not enough. Right? He's recognizing this gift is too great of a gift. He has nothing he can repay with. So what does he give her? What's his greatest gift? It's a hug. And if you know the show, you know like that's like the only time that's ever going to happen. 
Paul puts it this way in Romans. He says, he's talking in this Old Testament dynamic, but a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. A true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of law, rather it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. He says that this is a change of heart. It's a softening of the heart. It's a removal of all those other things out of our heart. It is things that only can be done by God's very hand and God's very work. All we can do is take that little step of faith towards him and start leaning into him to begin to discover this. But he says, it's not even in your effort. It's not even your work. It's the very work that God has to do. You have to be able to see and understand the greatness of the gift that is Jesus. You have to see the greatness of the gift that is Jesus at the cross. Dying for your sin. Dying for your hardened heart. Dying because he just loves you and he's not going to let anything stop him or keep him from expressing that love to you in a way you understand. In a way that will pay for your past sin. That will resolve all of the guilt that you carry. That will heal the resentment and bitterness of our hearts from what has been done to us and what we've done to others. See, that this is a work of God to transform us. That's what God is about. That's what God wants to do. That's what he's aiming at. He's not aiming at impressing us with miracles. He wants us to understand that he has come as this demonstration of God's love, and God wants you to wholeheartedly love him back. You can put it this way, that a person with this changed heart obeys God, actually loves God, just to get God. So often as people, without this change of heart, when we come to God, we come to God because we want something. Maybe we want him to fix something. We do that, Jesus, save me. We want God to fix something, heal something, save something. Or we come to God and we just want a blessing. God, give me this. Help this to be good. Thank you for these things. I want this or I want more of it. And we have this idea that we're going to kind of make this deal with God. God's point of this whole, us being wholehearted is we want God because of who God is. We, that's what love is. We want him for himself. This is the change of heart, but for this to even become a reality, God has to become beautiful to you. You have to begin to see the beauty of who God is and what he has done. And beauty is hard to quantify, right? I mean, we look at a sunset and there's this move of beauty, right? Or we look at nature and we go out into it and enjoy it and it's got this sense of beauty that, that sort of feeds our soul or it's artwork or it's music, right? Or it's a person that you just love and find beautiful and it just kind of heals us almost. And the same thing is true that God wants you to see the beauty of who he is for himself because it's the ultimate healing of your heart, your mind, your soul, your life. This is all we mean when we use this word worship. It is just to recognize the beauty of God. Sometimes it's about his greatness. Sometimes it's about his goodness. It's the fullness of this God who loves us wholeheartedly and made us to love back wholeheartedly. And all we can do to find that is just to step out in faith, like Peter, to simply step out and to cry out to Jesus and say, I want to begin to know this. And here's what's cool. You know that you're beginning down this journey when you hear the story of Jesus and you hear the story of the cross and you just feel something in your own heart start to give, start to move, start to respond, start to want it to be true, start to want it for your own life. And that is just the sign that God is at work in your heart. This is not a story, if you read of any just one instantaneous moment and everything gets fixed, it is a story of people on a journey to discover because our hearts are slow to respond. But as we take that step, one after another of following after him, we find more and more of who God is. But I want to just throw this out as a word of warning as I close this too, that Hebrews, it says this, it says, be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. And he's talking to people who are Christians right here. So make sure that your heart doesn't go back to, evil means the destructive cycle of things. It goes back to that list of stuff that can live in our heart and live in that world of resentment or, or envy or anger or lust or slander or murder or whatever it might be. Turning you away from the living God because you are only in relation, when you are in relation with his love, you want God for God. 
You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. And notice in that he is saying, you're going to need other people in your life for this. This isn't just something that happens between you and God. That being wholehearted towards God is not just you and God walking along and you guys are wholehearted together and it's wonderful. He's saying this is the point of community. This is the point of this word church. He doesn't mean just the, the event. He means the people coming together. We need each other who can speak not as formally as this saying like, I'm warning you, but you know, the people that walk alongside, they can say like, remember what happened last time you did that? Remember what happened last time we, we, we changed our priorities? The last time we stopped reading scripture, stopped being in prayer, stopped attending a life group, stopped going to church, stopped serving other people, did whatever to replace those things. Let whatever other idol get in the way. He's saying, look, don't be deceived. It can still harden your heart. You can still begin to lose out on what it is to live a wholehearted life of love with God. So there's never a point where we cease needing to be on point, cease being prioritized, and cease looking for the beauty, cease wanting God for God himself. To take this down to just one simple sentence, Epicurus nailed it, you become what you give your attention to. This is all I'm saying when it comes down to this question of like, how do we soften our heart? How do we change our heart? How do we know that God is at work in our heart in this way? It comes down to what we give our attention to. This is Peter, right? His attention is on Jesus. He's walking on water. His attention is on Jesus' hair blowing in the wind. He sinks. What do we give our attention to? How do we begin to make this a part of our day? And it's not the attention of everything. It's Jesus. Putting our attention on Jesus, specifically Jesus on the cross for us, Jesus paying the price for us, Jesus demonstrating God's love. It's not the focus even on our sin and what we're doing wrong and what needs to change. It's on God's unstoppable love. That's what will begin the process of changing us. That's what will put us in partnership with God's Holy Spirit who wants to be at work in our life. And it's doing that with other people. Because, if we come back to our original question, given enough time, can you solve all of your problems? I hope you know wholeheartedly that you can't. That you never will on your own. You you won't even with the help of the perfect person. Even if your soulmate showed up, they're not going to be enough. And God is intended to be your wholehearted soulmate. He's what you need. He's where life comes from in every sense of life. And I love this, and I want to close with this, but but Paul puts it this way. He says, look, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And what he means by that is you will start a relationship with God. Your, Your past is forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. You step now into this relationship. It's where you can begin to discover the fullness. And it's a journey. It's an adventure of discovering God's love for you. It's where the healing begins. Because it is by believing in your heart that you were made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you were saved. He says it's as simple as me believing it and then just putting it into words. We call that prayer. Talking to God about this. And I'm just going to ask all of you just to close our eyes. We're going to close in prayer. But if you want to begin that conversation with God this morning, I'm going to invite you just to pray a simple prayer. You can, you can repeat what I'm saying. You can pray your own in your own heart. But this is a simple idea. Just to begin this conversation with God, pray something like, Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. I know that I'm not able to fix all my problems. And I know that my heart is not wholly yours, but I want it to be. And right now I'm putting my faith in your son, Jesus' death and his resurrection, that he paid for all of my sin to give me your life. I want to see you as beautiful. And I want to know you, Father. say this in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes closed just for a moment because I want to give an invitation. This is the final thing I'm going to do, but I just want to ask if there's anybody here who decided this morning that you wanted to pray that prayer for the first time, you wanted to begin that relationship with God. I'm going to ask you, everybody else is not looking, just to look up at me and just raise your hand and wave at me for a second if that's you this morning. And if that is, just to let me know. 
because I want to be praying for you and I want to welcome you into this awesome family of believers. Anybody want to do that this morning? Okay. I see. It's good. Anybody else that I'm missing? Okay. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this chance to begin. Thank you for those who are this morning discovering a little bit more of your grace and your goodness. Lead us all on this journey forward to know you, to follow you, to love you. Father, thank you that you do this in us. It's not up to us. It is in your power. It is through you that we come to know your love. We thank you again. And we do pray all this in your name, Jesus, as you made it possible. Amen.